I'm Andrew Graham Dixon, and I'm an art historian. We're in the basement of Italian history. And I'm Giorgio Lucatelli, and I'm a chef. Forza, onctuous. We are both passionate about my homeland, Italy. Come on, everybody, let's go! The rich flavor and classic dishes of this land are in my culinary DNA. Pasta would be like egg. And this country's rich layers of art and history have captivated me since childhood. It actually brings out the naked body all the more. In this series, we'll be traveling all the way down the west coast of the country, from top to toe, stepping off the tourist track wherever we go. This is so Italian. I want to show off some of my country's most surprising food. It is hot. <sighs> often most bored out of necessity, but leaving a legacy that's still shaping Italian modern cuisine around the world. Ooh. And the art too is fantastic, exotic, deeply rooted in history. The final stretch of our journey takes us to the Mezzogiorno. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth. Naples and the south, Italy's wild west. Here, invaders and foreign empires have shaped the culture and cooking over millennia <laughs> to make this Italy's most exotic region. Come on, everybody, let's go! Driving your scooter in Naples, this is the thing you want to do. E come noi ce l'hanno fatto mettere, noi no! <laughs> Ciao! Ciao! Our journey starts in one of my favorite cities, Naples. A wild, wonderful place, unlike anywhere else in Italy or the world. And the only way to really experience it is on two wheels, not four. Let's try to not get robbed now. Naples' identity is born of centuries of foreign rule. Greek, Roman, French and Spanish empires have all left their mark on a city that's often compared to Cairo and Bombay. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's called Spacca Napoli, because he cut Napoli in half of it. Visitors always used to say, come to Naples, for the monuments, for the architecture, for the painting, for the buildings. But above all, you come for the people. For the people. You come for the sense of real life, street food, markets. Look at that. Teeming with life. Why are 200 beautiful Neapolitan women going round the central obelisk of the Piazza Gesù in a circle? What's going on? By a Fellini-esque coincidence, we've arrived in the middle of a casting session for the Naples Film Festival. Look, they're waiting for us! Yeah, we arrived! Yeah. <laughs> Napolitans are famous for their sense of theatre, and people have been coming here to enjoy the vibrant and raucous street life for centuries. In the 1700s, it became the sensational climax of the Grand Tour. The rite of passage undertaken by European aristocrats as part of a classical education. You would see Naples and die, as the saying went. Been talking so much. I'm taking Andrew to a place that allows us to glimpse that Naples. The one that dazzled 18th and 19th century visitors, including Goethe and Byron. Come, we get to go up here. What a place. <laughs> Andrew, come and have a look at this. This is crazy. Nativity scenes, presepe, have been popular in Italy since the Middle Ages. But in the 18th century Naples, they evolved into a unique art form, one that still lives on today. This is a particularity of the presepe from Naples, then the, what, what is, you know, the today, everyday business becomes part of the presepe. So the nativity scene mushrooms into all of this mm. daily life, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, but it never, that's never separated from the presepe, from no. the nativity. Se visuta. Se if they si. leave, you're sacred because you're part of these sacred things and goes around you. So we've got these real people from the 18th century who sort of have entered the scene. I like this character. 
he's a character straight out of 18th or 17th century painting from Naples. A lot of them have these goiters, yeah, look at that. these lumps in the throat. Yeah, look, the woman has here as well, look at that. They were people who lived on the land and then they all crowded into the city and they were just fed on bread, bread but they suddenly pizza. lose all their fresh vegetables. And look, there is no presepe without Pulcinella eating the spaghetti, which is kind of represent the poor people, the Lazzaroni, the, the people who eat pasta with their hands. But you know, one of the Bourbon king was actually spot doing this, eating the spaghetti like that. It's kind of like say, you know, that he to was say, well, I'm, shocking. I'm one with the people. That's what, right. That was his yeah, message. Right. What I'm just uh, worried about is just uh, maybe the tomato sauce. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Yeah, this is, I think this is lacking in realism, this sculpture, because surely there should be... There should a little be bit of tomato sauce. There is a little bit there, but... <laughs> yeah. This exotic southern city, with its extremes of wealth and poverty, fascinated 18th century visitors because it seemed right on the edge of civilised Europe. Oh, grazie. So, allora, what did you order? Una sorpresa. Il papà. Oh, look, you're picking it up, but you have to hold him down because otherwise he floats away. It's so light. Come allora. Oh, buonissimo, guarda che roba. I just noticed this rather beautiful picture on the box that the sweets came in. It's an image of Naples in the 18th century, which is a vivid reminder of just why Naples was one of the great tourist destinations for centuries. This beautiful half-moon-shaped bay, which has now been rather industrialised, but in those days it was paradise on earth. Mm. There's Vesuvius smoking in the background, that's still there. When the English visitor came here to Naples, what they were utterly amazed by was the people, the number of them, their liveliness there, the way that they would shout rather than talk, the way that they lived outside, not indoors, the way that they were so extrovert. The way they spaghetti with the hens, the Lazzaroni. <laughs> the, exactly, the Lazzaroni. And on the one hand, you can feel that people like Goethe or Byron, they're a little bit frightened. Right. But they're also thrilled. They, can, right. they, they see these people, these southern people, of having a kind of freedom. You know, they're free from property. They don't own anything. Right. They're free from cares in the idealised version, but they're right. also a bit dangerous. The city visited by the grand tourists of the past was characterised by its extravagant Baroque art and architecture, full of dramatic effect and stark contrasts. And there's one chapel that shows off the Neapolitan Baroque in all its sensual glory, the Capella San Severo. So here we are. <laughs> Let's face the altar. <laughs> Just take it in. This is one of the great Baroque chapels ever created here in Naples, ever created anywhere. And it's all conceived by one man, Raimondo di Sangro. Mm. And it's said here in Naples that that portrait of him, which is Dorian Gray style, decayed with time, has done so because God is not happy with him. Hmm. At the heart of the chapel are two sense-stunning sculptures, both on the theme of the veiled body. And again, he's commissioned a representation of modesty. Now, his mother died when he was only one, so he never knew her, never knew what she looked like. Right. Wanted, I think, to preserve her memory forever as a remote, celestial, perfectly innocent, perfectly formed being. What would you think if that was your mother? I mean, it's... As much as I love my mum, <laughs> you know, I would never commission something like that about her, you know what I mean? This is a little bit hard for me, your mum. <laughs> he didn't see it that way. <laughs> for him, it was an allegory of purity, you know. There was scandals. Yeah, I and mean, there was, to put it, you know, Naples had a kind of nipple problem, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I mean, seriously, the nipple problem was taken very, very seriously. And, and he did get into trouble over this. This was seen as being sacrilegious. In his next commission, the same technique was applied to a subject so sacred it was beyond reproach. The veiled Christ. That is absolutely mesmerizing. <laughs> 
It's something that the ancient Greeks discovered, that if you clothe a sculpted body in a fabric, it actually brings out the naked body all the more. Sometimes to make the, the eroticism more pronounced, but here right. to make death all the more solemn and powerful and moving. It almost looks like the marble is transparent that you can see through the marble underneath of where the person is. It's such a fine covering that you can still see the holes where the nails were. Oh, so the little, the little finger. finger, you can actually see the little finger there. There is a, a great suffering in that body. You feel it by looking at it, don't you? Mm. to come to Naples just to see this. In 1735, Naples became the capital of an independent kingdom. Its monarchy, an offshoot of the Spanish Bourbon Empire, set out to make Naples a mecca of culture and gastronomy. Today, Naples is famous for pizza and pasta, but the Bourbons left us some incredible rich and complex dishes. This is a different side of Naples, Andrew. <laughs> I don't know if you, we're gonna like it as much as the poor one, I guess. It's lion. Oh, signora Elena, buonasera. Come va? Fantastic. Questi Andrew sono i signori di Gregorio. We have come to the magnificent apartment of Marchese Carlo de Gregorio Cattaneo di Sant'Elia whose family has been part of the Napolitan aristocracy for over 200 years. I'm going to cook them a classic dish from the golden age of the Bourbons. So, I'm going to cook you this dish that comes really from this 1800 tradition when the Bourbon were fed up with the southern Italian fare. They didn't like it. They thought it was like it was peasant food. It was not rich enough for them. Or it was not complicated enough. So this is one of the greatest dish. It's called sautu means over everything. Okay, I got meatballs, I got a tomato sauce, which is meat cooked with that, and then I got some chicken liver. So the idea is to have an envelope of rice, all the stuffing goes in, close it, and then we bake it. Out of all the ancient recipes that you could have chosen to revive or recreate, you had to choose one which involved risotto, didn't you? <laughs> and so Milanese. No, I really love it because of, the, of this symbiosis between the words surtout become sartu. So to me, the Napolitan, wherever they take or borrow something from the French, they can only make it better. You're going to love this, you know? I was reading that Queen Maria Carolina, Marie Antoinette's sister who married Ferdinand the Seventh, the guy who used to eat spaghetti with his hands, that she was the one who said, Oh, I don't like this food here. And she sent all of the court chefs off to Paris. And they arrived with all their airs and graces. Le monsieur. And then the Neapolitan chefs, they, they decided to take that word and change it for themselves, or they mispronounced it. But do you, you think is that fantastic? Do you think you're a monsieur? Do you think you're a monsieur? I'm, I'm not a monsieur, I'm a monsou. Monsou? Monsou. Yeah. Rice is over everything. Over everything. And, and there's a lot of everything. And there is a lot of everything, I was going to say to you, but you anticipate me. Four and a half hours so far, by the way. Should we go and meet the people, yeah, then, then you, you, all our guests? I think you deserve a drink. In the 18th century Naples, the Marchese family was at the center of power. This is the the Marchese di Squillace, Leopoldo de Gregorio. Period of gold because it was the period of liberty and autonomy of any government. Well, this was the only time when Naples was independent. You saw a periodo. Sì, 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 sì. Ma questa autonomia non piaceva alle potenze europee. E quindi questa è la storia della mia famiglia collegata ai Borboni. Quindi io sono fiero e orgoglioso di poter raccontare questa storia. We have take this Bourbon recipe back to the right person that can be the maximum judge for it. Wow! È una dura prova, Giorgio, sei tu. 
The Marchese's family had their own mansu as recently as 1960, and Sartu was often served on special occasions. Monsu. Come on, vero Monsu. <laughs> I really like it. I think it's, I'm proud of myself. Mm. It's fantastic. Allora, questo servitudo 9, perché 10 lo potrei dare solo a un monsù borbonico. You get 10 only if you are a real monsoon, so I'm not, so I get, I get 9. You get 9, pass the test. Oh dear, only 9. I'd give it 10. It's deliciously rich, meaty, sausagey, ricey, tomatoey. To tell the truth, I don't really think either Giorgio or I feel quite at home here. <laughs> Down to earth is more our style. Let's drink a couple of last toasts and beat a quick retreat. Before we leave Naples, I can't resist taking Giorgio to see one final masterpiece. A work of art that, to me, encapsulates the huge contrasts we've encountered here. I really want you to see what I think of as Caravaggio's greatest altarpiece, certainly his most ambitious painting. Yeah? He came here the summer 1606. He has just murdered a man. Yeah. There's a price on his head. <laughs> so Caravaggio is in deep trouble. But his arrival here coincides with the establishment of the Pio Monte della Misericordia. It's set up by seven noblemen to alleviate the plight of the poor here in Naples. And they say to Caravaggio, paint us a picture for our altarpiece. And it's called The Seven Acts of Mercy. Oh, mercy. Caravaggio's commission was to paint a message of hope for the poor. He set it in one of Naples' crowded streets in the night. And I think because he's been asked to crowd all seven acts of mercy into a single, very vertical composition, the result is a fantastic distillation of what it must have been like for him arriving in Naples. And he's walking through these streets crowded with the poor, crowded with Lazzari. He's carefully included every period of human history so you've got ancient Roman history, Simon and Pero, father and daughter. He was confined to jail, he was starving to death, and she saved his life by feeding him from her own breast. She wasn't allowed to take him food. She is pure. He is pure Napoli. She is pure Napoli, <laughs> isn't she? She is Napoli, even now. You've got modern day, the sacristan holding up the torch. You've got modern life again in St. Martin, the rich young man, like the rich young man who founded this place, giving away his wealth in the form of his cloak. Vestire gli nudi. Vestire gli nudi. Yeah. Clothing the naked. Then you've got Jesus Christ himself as a pilgrim coming to be housed. So all human life is here, all periods of human history are here. And yet my impression is that just as there's so little light in this terrible pool of darkness, you know how hard it is for people to be saved. The old man has to struggle. He's missed some of the milk. It's caught in his beard. The corpse is on its way to the tomb, but is that dead man or woman really going to be saved? To me, it's as if Caravaggio almost felt that salvation was something that he couldn't touch or see anymore. And I think that angel is almost, he's almost like pressing down on these people. Is he lifting them up? Or mm. is he pressing them down into the pit of poverty? Why is that hand on the angel like that? That hand is the hand of mercy. Naples wouldn't be merciful to Caravaggio. Three years later, after injuring a man in Malta, he returned to the city and was ambushed outside a tavern. And while the three accomplices held Caravaggio down, the man from Malta 
got his knife out mm. and cut Caravaggio's face off, it said. Oh. So, yes, you see Naples and die, that was certainly true for Caravaggio. At least we've seen Naples, wonderful, life-affirming city that it is, and survived. Now we are continuing our journey south into the region of Campania. Our route takes us along one of the greatest coastal roads of the world. It is spectacular, isn't it? This road really is carved into the... Like, it's almost like the time has carved through, you know, we have come through with people. This road was created in the 1830s. Andrew, one you, mistake and you're out, eh? You're not letting me do the Guida Sportiva? No, Guida Sportiva, man, be careful because it's wet. If you turn it around and that down there, man, I'm going to be really... <laughs> dead. I'm going to be really dead. <laughs> so, watch it. Today, Amalfi, the little town that gives its name to this peninsula, is a bustling tourist resort. A thousand years ago, it was a mighty maritime republic, rivaling Genoa and Pisa. Such a tiny little... That is pretty amazing, Andrew. So, what a huge cathedral for, for such a tiny place. It is, isn't it? Except, of course, Amalfi wasn't a tiny place. An Arab visitor came here in the 9th century and commented on Amalfi being far grander, far more opulent, far more populous than little Naples no way. around the corner. Yeah, Amalfi was... I didn't know that. Amalfi had a population of 70,000 at its height, comparable to the populations of Rome or Paris or London. And this cathedral, I mean, look at the size of it. You've got this beautiful tower with Romanesque arches, and at the top are these Arab-style towers, okay. decorated with Arab majolica. And that's a key to Amalfi's cultural and economic centre of gravity. They looked east, east and south. This wasn't just a city, this was a republic. Mm. And when they sacked Constantinople with the Venetians, the Amalfitani stole the relics of St Andrew. It was quite a common thing to do, called a sacra furta, holy theft. Okay. If, you didn't have a, if, if, if you didn't have a saint associated with your town, which they didn't, steal his relics <laughs> and make them yours. <laughs> In 1343, the coastline was devastated by a tsunami which destroyed Amalfi's harbour. The Maritime Republic never recovered. Before we head further south, I'm taking Andrew on a small detour. We can't leave the Amalfi coast without visiting a restaurant and draws in connoisseurs of fine dining from all over the world. I wanted to meet these guys. It's called Don Alfonso. Well, this is the guys we want to cook a plate of pasta with. He's the Don of pasta. Oh, well, you know, the main if man. there is somebody that you know can teach you something about pasta, or can teach even me something about pasta, but that's the guys. This Michelin star chef gets the inspiration for his recipe from his beautiful kitchen garden overlooking the island of Capri. Dove siete? Ah! Ah! Finalmente, ti abbiamo trovato! Come stai? Oh, che piacere! Oh, fantastico! Ti ho portato Andrew, guarda! Very pleased. Very pleased to meet you. Look, no wonder these tomatoes are good. Look, they're here looking at Capri all day. Because <laughs> I've been on holiday. Wait, it's it's like, we send the tomato plants on holiday in the front of Capri and then we eat them. It's like, you know. <laughs> the whole philosophy of this is that, you know, when the chef comes and work for him, the chef has to work in the land before they get into the kitchen. That's right. So they, he, he has really reinforced these incredible tight feeling that there is between the, the, the food that grows and what it transforms into food. Cosa cuciniamo? Cosa facciamo da mangiare? Facciamo il Vesuvio di Rigatoni, usando questi pomodoro. Vesuvius of Rigatoni. That's right. With this tomato, tomato and this eggplant this from, the, from the front. The restaurant is a family business and Don Alfonso has now passed the baton to the next generation. 
The older son. Solo Andrea. Nice. That's, that's Ernesto, his oldest son. <laughs> Andrew, this is the temple. This is a temple, you know. We are in the place. Is this the altar? This is the altar where, you know. Allora. Allora. So, Molto importante la base. The pasta has been cooked very, very hot. Two minutes only. Yes. I never saw a pasta dish made anything like that. Pure su una pasta, Giorgio. This is not a pasta dish. Eh. This is a volcano, man, of pasta. <laughs> Questo è un vulcano. We have talked Sorry. a lot about this great tradition of the manzù sì. in Naples. They are the modern manzù. They are the one who have taken the idea of serving a fantastic meal okay, to a level that was never even thought about it before. Indeed. Every five-star hotel now has an Italian restaurant in it. So it is this completely dedication to the land, to the ingredients, to the natural flavors that us really give us this big step forward. So Andrew, look, we're gonna get it out. No. It smells good. It smells fantastic, not good. A little bit of parmesan on top. Perfect. I love this. Okay. Three little, oh my God, okay. the smell is just like unbelievable. Now this is mozzarella sauce. Like a mozzarella sauce, like a mozzarella milk. And basil sauce. Yeah, Color of the Italian flags. He's got the old man. It's hey, it's fantastic. <laughs> Come on, taste it. Me first. <laughs> You've got to get a polpettina. Did you get a polpettina? Mmm. It's that delicious. And this is a dish that That's I feel. Really delicious. I really feel that it really shows all the goodness of this land. Ernesto è buonissimo. Sono proprio geloso che non l'ho inventato io un piatto così. I'm so jealous that I haven't invented this like that myself. <laughs> Just down the coast, there's a site whose foreign origins predate those of the Amalfi Republic by over a thousand years. I really wanted you to see Pestum, because so many people come to this part of the world and they go and visit Pompeii and Herculaneum, but for me, Pestum, it's much older. And I think it's even more spectacular. Look, here we are, here we are, here we are, look. It's the oldest set of fortifications of this extensive anywhere anywhere. I mean, look at that. That's ancient Greek. For the ancient, southern Italy was known as Magna Grecia, Greater Greece. The city of Poseidonia was founded around 600 BC. 300 years later, it became part of the expanding Roman Empire, and its name was changed to Pleistum. I really love this place. Isn't it fantastic? <laughs> I mean, the, just the force of it. it it's like, argh, ancient Greece. Ancient Greece. And what's so unusual here is that they've managed somehow to leave it as it was. You know, in the 18th century, you would come across it. Nothing spoilt it. There's no shops. These buildings are 2,600, 2,500 years old. This was built before the Parthenon. Before the Parthenon. This is ancient, ancient, ancient. But you can also, I think, feel the strength of the early Greeks. Mm, it's a great settlement. statement, isn't it? They, they expelled young men from the city-states and said, go and found a settlement. You can't come back for 10 years. If you come back, we'll kill you. Mm. So this is what they did. I'm really impressed with the scale and beauty of these temples. For the ancient Greeks, these temples dedicated to Hera and Poseidon were places of worship. But to 18th century visitors, it was the structures themselves that became objects of veneration. Imagine that you've just come from Naples, and you've seen all that Kelly Cuba rock architecture, yeah. you've experienced the, you know, the general debauchery of the city, <laughs> and suddenly you're confronted by the majestic simplicity of the ancient Greeks. And people who came here were just bowled over by it. Goethe said this was like a strike of lightning hitting his mind. Winkelmann, the most influential architectural theorist of the time, said, this is the pure water of antiquity. And of course, they didn't know uh, Greek art. They didn't know Greek architecture, not really, because Greece was controlled by the Ottoman Empire, so it was off limits. Pestum was this, it was this bolt from the blue. It's really outstanding. 
It's not just the architecture here that's inspiring. In 1968, the excavation of a tomb led to a discovery that transformed our knowledge of Greek painting. As far as I know, these are the oldest surviving wall paintings from ancient Greek culture. Therefore, they're the oldest surviving wall paintings in all of Western art. Okay. It's been dated around 480 BC. These pieces formed um, an enclosed tomb. Right. Painted inside to be like a room or to be like a world, so that the deceased could have with him forever the things or the people that he wanted. Over here, we've got the scene of, you know, the ancient Greek symposium. This is a homoerotic world, no women. If you're going to be in love, you'll be in love with a man. So there's two men embracing. Those guys look so muscly, like they really look like, you know, that's like the original, bodybuilders. That's something. the ancient Greek six-pack right there, isn't it? Yeah. But the most striking thing, and the largest image, is the one that was created for the roof. The this ceiling. Is, yeah, the ceiling. This is what yeah. he would have imagined himself looking up at for all eternity. This extraordinary image of a diver in midair, and he's heading down towards the sea. And he's this sort of diagram of energy coming down to enter the great nothingness of the sea. And this plant's coming up. And it seems to me that if he's diving down, the plant's diving up. And that somehow he's becoming the plant, you know, that everything is becoming everything else, that life is a form of becoming in death. And that when you're, when you're gone, yes, you're gone, but you're not completely gone, that you end up coming up in another way. But I don't know, I don't know. I just think it's a wonderful image. Oh, well, Andrew, if you don't know, nobody knows then. <laughs> no, I'm, sure, I'm sure someone will work it out in the end. Pestum was the last stop of the Grand Tour. Even today, few tourists venture further south unless it's to go to Sicily. So they miss out on the Mezzogiorno's wildest and most mysterious region. Now we're going to get into the Mezzogiorno. Calabria. Calabria. It had a reputation in the 18th century. It was known as a place where civilized people just don't go, ruled by brigands. I think it's probably changed a bit since then. The Calabrian landscape is defined by spectacular mountain ranges. In the 1860s, much of this wilderness was controlled by brigands, southerners who resisted the unification of Italy because they saw it as a northern idea. We have arrived in the Valley Cooper, in the Sila Mountains. Ciao, Carmine! Come stai? Carmine has offered to be our guide. Why are we going in this rather beautiful Fiat Panda? Well, because the car is too low, that one, to go anywhere. <laughs> then because Carmine is a super driver. You're going to have an experience now, Andrew. This is like, um... This is an experience for you. This is okay. <laughs> <laughs> Carmine knows this piece of the Calabrian wilderness like the back of his hand. He told us that Thomas Aquinas' mother once lived in these ruins, just before making an intriguing adjustment to his car. Now he's putting the 4x4, four four, so now it's going to go fast. So hang on for your dear life, my dear friends. 4x4. 4x4. Vai! Vai, Salvador! Is this, is this basically a Calabrian driving lesson? This is a Calabrian life lesson, man. Uh, this is super. I love this. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Go, 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 Carmine. <laughs> What do you do as a profession, Carmine? I am a doctor agronom and I do the botanic. You're a doctor, a doctor of botanics. Do you work in this natural park or not? Yes. 
studi di piante, eccetera. Sì, sì le piante, l'ecologia, la, la natura, sì, molte. He published two books about herbs and things like that. That's how we get to know him. This, this amazing smell of different herbs. I can smell oregano, I can smell mint. Eh? Sento l'odore delle erbe sì, proprio sì. mentre passiamo. Questo è lentisco. Lentisco, yes. Que que Fuck quella bacca che è ottima per... Yeah, it's like a pepper, no? Come yeah. il pepe. Sì, è della stessa maniera Lentisco is like a wild pepper. And they're really, really good to serve with meat. Like, as you're going across, and obviously we're crushing some stuff. <laughs> Carmine isn't only a botanist, he's also a local historian. And in the heart of the valley, he points out the ancient hideout of bandits who used to terrorize the area. Quella, quella zona là si chiama Parlare, si chiama. Parlare. In, in like dialetto chiama. Parrasune. Per, perché eh, ancora oggi si sentirebbero i, i briganti, perché era una zona in questa vallata piccola che era la zona in cui si dividevano il bot, bottino. Okay, yeah. The briganti used to steal things and so then they would take their bounty back here and to so they would discuss how to share it. So this area here is still called parlare, which means talk. Because you, hear, you can still hear the briganti. So they call those woods the talking woods. Yeah. Because you can still hear them. That's right. Still are arguing about Carmine also wants to show us the bandit's hidden trail, a track so rugged even he can't drive down it. Wow, Andrew, that is incredible. Look at this. No way. No. There's something of the Wild West about it. It's so menacing, isn't it? It is kind of menacing. <laughs> Ah. Carmine, ma quanto, quanto è grande, quanto è lungo? Questo è lungo 7 uh, km. It's 7 km long. It's 7 km long. It slides the mountain through. Sì. E quando è stato scoperto questo? Questo è stato scoperto circa 10 anni fa. It's been discovered about 10 years ago. Solo? Sì, solo 10 anni fa. Eh, ma prima uh, era frequentato da, dai briganti. Eh, so so was, was a secret passage way for, for the briganti to just move around. And obviously, you know, normal people wouldn't use it because if you meet the briganti in, then you're finished, so nobody would come by here. When we're talking about this place being wild, this is it. This is what Calabria is all about. Wild, man. Andiamo. Forza e coraggio. So what, what, when you're a child in Calabria, do you play like brigands and peasants? Instead of cowboys and Indians? Can you translate, The brigands of old still exist in Calabria. They call Andrangheta. A fearsome local mafia, they have tarnished the region to such an extent that many tourists are scared to come here. But Carmine wants to change that. He wants to alert the world to Calabria's rich cultural heritage and vast tracts of unspoiled nature. Next stop, his favorite tree in the forest, the good giant. Eccolo. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is fantastic. È un vero gigante. È un vero gigante questo. I've never seen a chestnut. I, I, you know, I've only seen oak trees this big, never a chestnut tree wow. this big. Wow. È un castagno di 600 anni. 600 years old. 600 years old. This is like a monument. It's not a tree. How nome quest, quest albero? Si chiama il gigante buono perché è molto generoso. So this tree on its own produce 400 kilo of chestnuts a year. And that's why they call the good giant. Obviously the chestnuts comes on a very low season. It's the last gift. It's the one that's going to get you through the winter. Not only they will just eat the chestnut roasted like that. They will dry them in the pastillado, which is this purpose-built house. And then they will be turned into flour. Then so they you make can, bread and they you make, make pasta. I, I never heard of chestnut bread. When you're starving, I'm telling you, you find out things that you can never imagine. You know, and these people were starving. There was nothing else to eat. There was, huh. you know, 
produce of the land, plentiful in certain seasons, but then a really hard, long winter. If you had chestnuts, you had life. You can survive the winter. If you didn't have the chestnut, that's it, you would die. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the way so it was. That's why the veneration of the chestnut tree. That's why it's, huh. it's, it's the big bosses here looking down at us. Before we leave Carmine's corner of Calabria, he wants to give us a taste of his hospitality. He's invited us to an evening feast at his family home. And luckily, we've got a couple of hours for our stomachs to get over the 4x4 experience. I actually banged my head on the roof. Do you? That's good. Maybe you mature a little bit. This is a massaggio calabrese. Molto bene. Carmine is such a mild mannered gentleman, scholar. Non ci abbiamo fretta. Behind the wheel, he's, uh, he's quite transformed. <laughs> Calabrian cuisine is as varied and as generous as the land. I'm curious to see what Carmine and his family will be serving up tonight. I'm expecting a lot of meat. They don't eat much fish here even though they live so close to the sea. I wouldn't be surprised to see quite a lot of Greek influence, but let's see. So what we got here? Che cosa ci abbiamo qua? Questa è la pizza con due T. So it's between a pizza and a pizza bread. Because the sì. Greeks were here, they ruled sì. this place, so sì. they love the idea of the pita bread. This is so typical of, of the cuisine sì. of Calabria. And, and there is this mixture of vegetable and pork. The pork sì. lasted the winter and the vegetable one lasted sì. the summer. Oh. From humble ingredients come an extraordinary bounty and rich cuisine. I love this method. She's rolling it round a stick. This was the only way to allow the pasta to have this space in the middle so it cooks evenly. The sauce will run through and the cooking will be evenly because the boiling water comes through the thing. When you're talking about ergonomics and when you think about Italians being so good at designing cars and designing beautiful um, stuff, these where it all started. Andrew, come and have a look at this. We, we, we have to come down here to get the piñata. That's the piñata. Wow. This shows the Greek influence in their food. Cooking it in an amphora. So, chickpea, salt, water. In an amphora, then it's put next to the fire at least four hours. I want you to taste it before they go up. She's going to take them up now. Mmm. Good. Really tender. It's the custom for every guest to contribute something. And my dish is a simple fried potatoes and wild mushroom from Carmine's woods. Just saute them, Lada. <laughs> Carmine is a botanist, so the mushrooms are the same. The, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems to me that you're always most at home in this kind of situation. You see, Andrew, I feel affinity with this food. There is the produce of the land and the produce of the experience of the people through the years. This is nothing scientific about it. This is not pretentious. This is transforming something into something edible at the, with the best that they can do. That's it. A Calabrian feast is like a banquet of different dishes and flavors. And to enjoy it, you better have a healthy appetite. <laughs> so what's it comes at you from all angles. It's like, it's like Carmine's driving. You don't know, like, boof, baff, baff, boof. <laughs> and then there's suddenly there's some chili sauce on the side, and there's pasta, and there's cheese, and there's. It's all happening all at the same time. If you look for truthfulness, then you come to Calabria. Oh, that's the chestnut bread. Grazie. Wow. If this was the bread that they had to eat, because there was nothing else to eat, they were quite lucky. Yes, <laughs>
After the fall of Rome, Calabria was ruled by the Byzantine Empire for the best part of 600 years. We're looking at this absolutely beautiful landscape. Very dry, very mountainous. It reminds me of parts of Greece. Particularly this part of Calabria is a little piece of the greater Greek world in Italy. They, they spoke Greek here until the 1600s. That's, That's the principal language. Um, and I think the, the reason we're coming here is I wanted to show you um, this place that, that to me really is like a little piece of Byzantine Greece here in, here in Calabria. In the 7th century, the Valley of Stilo became a refuge for Greek monks fleeing the east to escape religious persecution. They call this bit of Calabria Mount Athos in Italy. Here you've got one of the few remaining relics of Byzantine Greek Christianity. 10th century, I mean really early. It's difficult to find these churches nowadays. I, I visited a beautiful one in Macedonia, but i never seen one in Italy. Isn't it beautiful? No, unfortunately, the fre fresco that would have once been in the dome has gone. I love these angels. Yeah. Very Eastern faces. Don't they look Greek? Mm. You know, but you still see those faces like, in the cafes and, and on the streets. You still see them. And over here, they've dated this column. Apparently, this is the 4th century BC. So this column they've taken from a Greek temple and they've reused it. And you must get the different slices of history, because down here you've got a Roman capital. So that should be on top. That should be on top. <laughs> you've got Roman, Greek, and here there's an Arabic inscription which says there is only one true God. And that dates from the time when the Arabs had a great deal of power here, and they possibly used this building actually as an oratory. It's almost like an X marks the spot. One of the very few surviving remains of this astonishing upsurge of Eastern Christianity here in this corner of Calabria. Hmm. Vieni. Andiamo. It's astonishing how this church has witnessed the passage of so many different religions. To me, it's another beautiful and revealing chapter of the history of Calabria. Please. And two. Look at this. Norman Cathedral, Arab details. Back, in, ti back in time, we are. Come in, then I'm going to cook you something for tonight. The I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Again. It's going to be your. going to be fantastic, you'll see. In two days I'm working at it. I love these little alleys. Do you? Yeah, undo that. This is what you're going to eat tonight. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? I mean, it's like a kind of prehistoric creature. Funny enough, we are in a, uh, in a, in a piece of land that has got the Tyrrhenian Sea on one side, the Ionian in the other side, but what the people eat in the land is these. What is Stockfish it? Stockfish is married with potato, Tropea onions, the onions from Tropea, the most famous red onions in the world, this one. Bit of parsley, tomato sauce is local as well. The fish gets kind of soaked for 48 hours. So here what it becomes. So that is this? This is rehydrated, you see? So we've got some olive oil, which is obviously local olive oil, which is fantastic. We get the onions to go in the pan, and this goes on the fire. OK, so it's low. We're going to break it in like that with it, OK? A little bit. And then the other we're going to have add it after. The onions are growing in the very sandy terrain because apparently where Tropea was, there was like a volcano. And then the sand from Africa has been brought in by the wind and filled up the whole volcano. So you have a very special sandy terrain. And so the onions are sweet. We don't put any salt because the fish is already salt enough. Huh? Some water from the Aspromonte. This is the water that comes from this mountain. So it's pure, it's beautiful. Get the fish now. <laughs> Get the fish. <laughs> you are incredible. Okay. 
we're going to put the potato on top of it. And you don't put any salt? No salt at all. So that really is straightforward. Should we go and contemplate the beauties of the landscape? Now we can. Is he boiling? I want to hear it going like that. Ah. <laughs> After enjoying a passeggiata, I think it's time to check on a stock of fisso. Smell of food wafting up. <laughs> Our food is really ready in a minute. Do you I, think it's ready yet? I think so. Let's go and have a look. Let's go and have a meal. Let's go and have something. But look at this, it's one little square after another little square. It's such a pretty place, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Stoka Fiso. Bubbling away. Just add the parsley at the end of the cooking. Come, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That looks perfect. There you are. So what do we start with? A bit of fish and... You start as you again. want. OK. Or responsible to put it in the pan. You're responsible to put it in your mouth. You could have done with a bit of salt. That's true. You could have done with a tiny bit of salt. I've been really careful because I was really scared about the salt. It's really, really lovely and it's simple. Well, that's lovely. I have to say that personally, this is my kind of food more. I, pre I prefer this. That's why we travel together. Chin -chin. To Calabria. To Calabria. Our final destination on the tour of Italy is the city of Reggio Calabria. Reggio has been repeatedly destroyed by earthquakes, and the way it's been rebuilt has an always represented Italy's finest. It's not the best architecture, is it? No, it's just gone wild. Reggio might not be as picturesque as Naples, but it's home to two of the greatest works of art in the world. You wouldn't imagine it from the setting, the regional government building for Reggio Calabria, but inside... It's scary, isn't it? The Riachi bronzes are a pair of truly exceptional ancient Greek sculptures, currently being restored by Nuncio Scapis, a wonderfully warm conservator who's welcomed us into his den. OK, welcome. Just have a look, Giorgio. These are, are the bronzes so the close to it. They're two warriors. Mm. They were found by a scuba diver who was diving just off the coast and he saw a hand sticking up from the sand and his first thought was there was a dead body down there. Oh, of course. So he dived down, touched the hand, realised it was bronze and these were staying out of there. They are the greatest surviving sculptures of true ancient Greece. Well, in such an amazing state of preservation, look at this. The six-pack. He heroic martial military six-pack. He was once holding a weapon. We don't know about the origins of the sculpture, but I like to think that they were perhaps one of this famous group of eight bronze heroes created as a great monument to the Greek victory at the Battle of Marathon. And it's interesting that they should have been found here in Reggio Calabria because during the period where the Romans took over Magna Graecia. Mm. Of course, the Romans loved Greek art, and to have managed to get their hands on these, that would have been absolutely fantastic. So I wonder if the boat that lost these sculptures off the coast here was actually on its way to Rome. What makes these sculptures so remarkable was the technology pioneered to create them, the so-called lost wax method. So this shows you how they created the sculpture. It's hollow inside. Bronze was an immensely expensive material. So what they did was they made the model of the foot and of the leg. They would create that from clay. Uh -huh. They would then paint wax inside, fill it with earth, pack it with earth on the outside, and then pour the bronze. The wax would melt, and you're left with the form that you've modelled, but now That's it's right. made of bronze. Mine bronze, yeah. But so many bronze sculptures are gone. Bronze sculptures got melted down, turned into cannons, cannons, into weapons. You know, so much was lost. That's one of the miracles of this discovery, is that, it, you know, just the fact that it's still here. If you really look at the detail, under this missing hair, you can see the ear. They did, they, they, even, they even bothered to create the, the ear that, that right. was going to be covered by the hair, right. but they yeah. still made the ear. I can't believe this fact that he has the ears underneath the right. of, of right. his hair. Right. Did you know that the tooth 
teeth. I they saw are, the they're teeth. Cover, are they made of silver? They're, they're covered in silver. But those are, those are the only teeth right. of any bronze sculpture right. from ancient Greece. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. You can actually see they've got eyelashes. Eyelashes, really? Little yes. tiny eyelashes made of points. Actually, they use a lamina. They cut each little piece and make each uh, hair. E yeah, each, each eyelash. Each eyelash. It's like the past is looking at us. At you. You, know, you feel like they are, you look at them, they look at you. It's like they want to protect you. Like guardians? Yeah. So what do you think? Are you pleased to see? I was sing? just so pleased that we come here. Thank you for that. Hey. It's really fantastic. Like what Nuccio says, they have a personality. It's a person there. It is not just a statue. It is something that is live. These things, you can see the blood running through their veins. Good finale to the trip? I think this is the best finale we could ever have. Yeah. For me, this is the top. Our journey that began in Genoa, over a thousand kilometers to the north, is at an end. We have reached the tip. Sicily. Beloved Sicily is there. Look at that. So close to the, to the foot. Yeah. But there is one thing, there's one thing that you cannot miss here. It's called Anduja. 50% pork, 50% chili. The antibiotics property of the chili are used to cook, to cure the actual pork. So that means there is no salt in it. <laughs> Ching! <laughs> close your eyes, close your eyes. And that is Calabria coming to you. It's hot. <laughs> it's spill. It's hot. <sighs> <laughs> they are extremely, like, warm people and, and generous and, and, you know. Mad. You know, I think it's a bit like Sicily, the story here. The Calabrians are beginning to realise what they've got in terms of art and architecture Architect. and antiquities and cuisine. And they're beginning and to nature. put... Nature. And nature, exactly. And they're beginning to put that together. Do you remember where we started? We started in Genova. Oh, and my God. Travelling around Liguria and the pesto, <laughs> and it's all green, and the people are rather reserved and quiet. Very English. And as we've gone on and on and on further south... The Toscans, you remember, in Livorno. <laughs> It becomes really louder like, and louder and louder and, and hotter and hotter, hotter and hotter. hotter. We're getting close to Africa here. Yeah. I think on this journey I've been more conscious than ever of the vast differences between the different regions of Italy. The difference between the people is so enormous and you need to understand that. A Milanese is an Italian like a Napolitan, but they're two different animals, you know? Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And do. We reached the bottom, but now what's left to do? is to go up to the Adriatic side. More? You want to go around the Adriatic? Yeah, all the way up to Venice. That's more than a thousand miles. That's OK. QI coming next on BBC Two. Stephen Fry's got his knickknacks out for some quite interesting questions linked to the letter K. Well, on BBC Four now, big stadium rockers Bon Jovi in concert at the BBC Radio Theatre. 